Come on, b- Come on bitch, bitch, let's, let's go. go. Let's go. guys i hope you had a spectacular week i cannot believe we're at episode 165 of dishing drama dana today i wanted to talk about some of the scandal that broke this week about jonathan odie uh he was part of i guess cassie's lawsuit as it related to p diddy and the allegation she made about freak offs he was one of the paid escorts by p diddy that cassie mentions in the lawsuit and odie admitted that he had sex with cassie we're going to get into all of that i'm going to explain it now there was some rumors going around that he died this week i figured out where he is he's not dead actually so i wanted to tell you guys the story and also tell you where he is in case you were wondering and then i wanted to dive into something that happened which was i had dropped an episode called nt of crazy days and nights and hot water and holiday miracles afoot episode 162 of dishing drama dana and Uh, A young lady heard that episode and reached out to me because she had had a story she wanted to tell about an encounter with Enti that kind of reflected what Cassandra went through. And I found this obviously interesting because Cassandra has dropped this website called antilawyer.com. And then there's a link to her podcast. She dropped one episode, I think, free that explains what happened between herself and Anti Lawyer. Uh, Cassandra has been doing an expose on Anti Lawyer because, well, you got to go and check it out. I'm not going to get into the whole thing here. Most of you probably have heard about it by now. But anyway, she also, uh, has a patron and she drops receipts in there. So I was interested by this young lady that came forward and wanted to tell me her story because I've heard Cassandra's story and I've also received all of Cassandra's receipts. So I'm interested in this because, you know, NT was flirting with me and asking me to lunch and there seems to be some patterns and all of this to do with him. And it was shocking to me. I considered Enti a friend. I guess the idea of Enti, I mean, how friendly can you be with an, uh, you know, an an alias, but you know, it it just was very shocking to me and, and upsetting, especially since I was such a big advocate for his work and his gossip and his research. So anyway, disappointing. Not the first time I've been disappointed though or surprised by somebody. Now, something that's really weird is I keep covering Enti and Cassandra at the same time that I end up covering P. Diddy and Cassandra. And I don't know, it's just the strangest thing. It's it's like they're connected in some other universe or something. I don't know why that keeps happening, but it does. Now, I am going to put some links I decided in the description of this audio to things in the Patreon that you guys will want to see that I've done related to this topic that's going to really make a big impact on you if you like it uh, regarding P. Diddy and Cassandra and Enti and Cassandra. So, all right, so let's get started. This is an epic show. You guys, I can't tell you how epic this show is going to be. So uh, let's grab your coffee or your drink. If it's late at night, you're having some alcohol or or if you're going to eat dinner and you want to listen or clean your house because we're about to get into it. And boy, what a rabbit hole it is. Come on, bitch, 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 let's go. (laughs) So the first place we should start about Jonathan Odie and his allegations that are so incredible, but totally align with the allegations that Cassandra Ventura, Cassie, made against P. Diddy Combs in her complaint. So let's start at 
number five of her complaint against P. Diddy, number 76. It says, Mr. Combs forces Miss Ventura into sex trafficking. Within a few months of beginning a romantic relationship with 40-year-old Mr. Combs, the 22-year-old Miss Ventura felt beholden to his whims and demands. While in New York City, Mr. Combs told the Miss Ventura that he wanted to engage in a fantasy of his called, quote, voyeurism. Mr. Combs said that it would, quote, turn him on if he saw Miss Ventura with another dick. That's in quotes too. Number 78. The first time Mr. Combs hired a man and brought the man to his home in Los Angeles, the man, Mr. Combs and Miss Ventura, wore masquerade masks and ingested drugs. Mr. Combs directed Miss Ventura to perform sexual acts with this man while Mr. Combs watched them. He masturbated while he directed Miss Ventura and the man to do specific sexual acts. Number 79. The entire encounter lasted multiple days. 80. Mr. Combs began to call the arrangement a, quote, freak off or F.O. He would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura at random moments that he wanted an F.O. And Miss Ventura was eventually expected to facilitate the location and the hiring of the male sex workers. Number 81. At certain points during Miss Ventura and Mr. Combs' relationship, he would insist on an F.O. weekly. Mr. Combs would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura that this practice was, quote, our thing and, quote, our secret. Number 82. F.O.s would often take place in hotel suites, including the Trump International Hotel in Columbus Circle, Lormer Taj, Beverly Hills, the London Hotel in Los Angeles, the Intercontinental Century City, the Intercontinental Atlanta, the Intercontinental New York City, the One Hotel in New York and Miami, the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in New York and in Miami, the Fountain Blue in Miami, the Beverly Hills Hotel in Shutters Beach in Los Angeles. I thought this was interesting because you're going to find out if you don't already know that Jonathan Odie was not only allegedly the sex worker that participated in some of Cassie and P. Diddy's FOs as the hired hand that Cassie had sex with for P. Diddy's enjoyment. But in addition to that, you're going to find out that Jonathan Odie went into a Doral, Florida, Trump International Hotel and shot up the place while screaming about P. Diddy and Trump and conspiracy theories related to Trump mainly, okay? And during this whole thing, you're going to find out, or you already know, that Odie ends up getting shot in the leg and he gets arrested by police and a interrogation follows back in 2018 when this occurs. Now, I'm going to be playing you this police interrogation on the podcast today. And you're going to be probably triggered in a few different ways. Number one, some of you are going to be like, oh my God, he's so well-versed on every single conspiracy theory I have ever heard. I can't get over it. And I believe him totally. I 100% believe in all the things he does. And some of you are going to say, this sounds like a lot of it is crazy, but I do totally believe in what he's saying about P. Diddy and Rick Ross, just because it seems to completely mirror the allegations in Cassie's complaint, okay? Because she goes on to say that essentially in her complaint, which I, I read the entire thing and I did a whole video about it. It's in the description of this podcast episode. But suffice it to say that what she says is that Diddy is super well connected and he's got connections because of his celebrity power everywhere and his influence in the music industry. He also has unlimited money to bribe people as needed to be quiet to not speak their truth or, you know, if they're upset about something to just go away and sign an NDA. And that seems to be exactly what has happened with this gentleman, Odie. You know, I just want to say the complaint, the part that I was reading you goes on and it talks about how Cassie would have to find these male sex workers that would be approved by Diddy. And then she would have to arrange flying them in 
to multiple cities and also handle these arrangements for these FOs, which became a real obsession for P. Diddy, allegedly. In number 87, she says, Mr. Combs always supplied Miss Ventura and the sex worker with copious amounts of drugs before and during the FOs. Miss Ventura was given ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and alcohol in excessive amounts during FOs, which allowed her to disassociate during these horrific encounters. And then if you jump down to 95, it says, in the complaint. During some FOs, Mr. Combs would become extremely intoxicated and would hit Miss Ventura in front of the male sex workers. In 94, he says Mr. Combs would pay the male sex workers a few thousand dollars in cash for their services. Here we go. Down in six, it says Miss Ventura tries to escape Mr. Combs' abuse. Under 104, it says anytime she tried to create distance between her and Mr. Combs, he used his networks to find her and convince her to return to his abuse. Sometimes it was employees that would come looking for her. Sometimes it was people that worked for him. He had a network of enforcers, she says, in number 110, and she felt like she couldn't escape. She felt followed. She felt like they were coming for her no matter where she went. This is all outlined in her complaint. And the reason I'm telling you this before, I play you the police interrogation on Jonathan Odie is because he makes similar allegations throughout his interrogation. He claims that he has been harassed by Rick Ross on the orders of P. Diddy, that he was threatened by him. He said that he felt followed by people that worked for the government because P. Diddy had sort of relationships with a larger network and was trying to have him arrested for extortion and all of these things, which he said he didn't do. He claims that like just this feeling of like people are closing in on him and they're going to try to take his computer and all these things. Now, something you should know is legit P. Diddy did a settlement with Jonathan Odie, allegedly because of him being a sex worker and participating with these FOs. This comes out in his police interrogation. He admits that he had a settlement with P. Diddy, which basically took him from being broke or not very wealthy to being super wealthy. And allegedly he gets one and a half million dollars and buys a bunch of properties in Miami. I'm going to play you a news clip about this in a minute. They were covering it at the time from the perspective, like, how does this guy, you know, seem to go be poor and then rich overnight? They don't get into the P. Diddy part of the police interrogation, although they should have. But uh, essentially what he's saying is the reason he went from being broke to rich overnight is that Diddy settled with him to basically muzzle him to not talk about the FO parties he participated in with Cassie. And Jonathan also says in his police interrogation that he was doing copious amounts of drugs with Diddy. And in fact, you know, liquid cocaine is mentioned and all this, you'll hear it. He also describes that he participated in sex parties with Cass and P. Diddy. Now, remember that this police interrogation is back in 2018. The complaint with Cass that she makes against P. Diddy when all of this starts to come out and Diddy, uh, like, I think he settles with Cass like one day later. The complaint comes out on November 6th. 16th, 2023. This is like four years after this police interrogation is done with Jonathan, where you would frankly, at first listen, think he was a madman making it all up. But knowing what we know now that came out in Cass's complaint, it all adds up. And he seems to be telling the truth and that these wild stories are actually real and true. And that begs the question, how many of the wild stories he tells in this police interrogation are true? And that I can't answer 
for you. That's something you have to determine for yourself. I will tell you a few fun facts. He says Diddy is part of the Boule, which is an Illuminati group. And he isn't wrong. There is a real Boule group. In fact, I found an article from July 18, 1990 in the Los Angeles Times. It says elite fraternity widens agenda for black men. Boule are focusing more on social activism. Well, I have no doubt that during one of these FOs, Diddy must have told this sex worker guy while partying that he's involved with the Boule group, probably because this man seems very interested in all things conspiracy. So he's like a wealth of knowledge, as you'll see on a lot of the predominant theories. And so I think it, you know, Diddy probably has, uh, you know, some of them he wanted to validate to him high, I would imagine. Anyway, the Los Angeles Times writes this article from 1990. Listen to this. Elite fraternity widens agenda for black men organizations at the prompting of a younger generation. The prosperous and prominent member of the One Secret Boule, I'll say that again, Once Secret Boule, are focusing more on social activism. When the NAACP's conference ended here last week, civil rights leaders left behind a portrait of black men in crisis. Too many young black men said the civil rights group are underemployed, alternately feared, and reviled and living at risk. Now come the men of Sigma Pi Phi, a once secret black fraternity that celebrates the professional and material success of black men. Known as the Boule, the group is here this week for its biennial meeting and its own look at, quote, an agenda for the black male in the 90s. It was an invitation-only tuxedoed gathering of some of the most prominent and powerful black men in America who say they are struggling to define their responsibility to other black men. The ones the NAACP calls, quote, endangered. Boule is a Greek word designating a council of community leaders who advised kings. The reference members, the 3,000-man worldwide fraternity, is highly intentional. The roster of members here this week reads like a who's who among blacks. U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Louis W. Sullivan, Democratic National Committee Chairman, Ron Brown, Mayor Tom Bradley, NAACP Executive Director, Benjamin Hooks, like Yale Skulls and Bones, Secret Society, which George Bush belongs, the Boule has been criticized by some as a social anachronism and has challenged members to change its image. Incoming president, Dr. Benjamin Major, a retired San Francisco physician, said he is aware of changes, that the group is more interested in socializing and congratulating itself on its inviolable exclusivity than it is in making a substantial contribution to the rest of Black America. Quote, until eight or 10 years ago, we were just what we were perceived to be, said Major, who wants to make the group's social action committee more aggressive. We don't want to appear as if we were remaining above the problem problems of most black people. We know we didn't get here solely by the dint of our own hard work. We owe a lot of people and we have to give back to our brothers and sisters. All right. So you're kind of getting the energy here. So it is very possible that Diddy was invited to be a part of the Boule group, and that is not so far-fetched when you look into who they really are. Now, I think the tie to the Illuminati, and I, I air quote that, is that the NAACP actually did have leadership go to real Illuminati meetings. And what do I mean by that? There is actually a, an organization called the Illuminati, and it's been around, uh, the Rockefellers founded it, and it was a group of people that came in and it was supposed to be a think tank where people, you know, global leaders across different very influential clubs like our membership organizations and leadership and rich people and powerful people in companies and politicians internationally would come together and have a think tank on what should happen politically for the world. And that was the kind of idea behind it. It was supposed to be for good, for the the good of the world or whatever. And that is a real thing. And the NAACP was part of it. And I did study it in political science at USC, that one. 
that Illuminati, not necessarily what it's grown into that we see all over the internet these days. Now, even though their goal was supposedly for good, that doesn't mean they did good and they weren't maybe diabolical in their new world order schemes, but you know, that's how they taught it to us at USA. So there you have it. Jonathan Odie also brings up a game called the Illuminati, the game of conspiracy. Okay. These are cards that were developed back in 1994, 1995 time frame that Steve Jackson created. And there's lots of stuff to do with the game, like books. And there were later uh, another series of it. And it's basically world domination game using cards, but supposedly there are cards that actually seem to predict the future and things that have happened. Because remember, this game was created in 1995-96 timeframe. So it was supposedly having cards in it that showed Trump dead, that showed the Twin Towers falling down, covid coming about and even a capital riot. Okay. So people got really freaked out because supposedly these cards actually being done in 1995 based on Illuminati stories and theories and things seem to have come true. And I have a, a theory on how this came about, but I haven't worked it through yet. So I'm not ready to tell you guys it, but I will tell you that I did order the original book that had the meaning of the cards that was printed back in 1994. So I can just make sure that what they intended when they made the cards was what people think it means so that, you know, we're not making any big leaps just because it looks a certain way that we're like, oh, that must mean that, that it really was the intention of the people who published the cards. Because indeed, if there is a card, you know, that it clearly states that its symbolism was a worldwide pandemic coming in the future that was going to wipe out the population. And it has themes of, you know, similar to COVID, like a giant flu. I'm going to find that really compelling, right? I'm going to go, wow, you know, what does that mean? It means to me anyway, that this gentleman who made this card set Steve Jackson probably got a hold of some of the old meeting minutes that were coming out of the Illuminati meetings. By the way, when I was studying, it was back in 1995 when I was at USC. That would have been exactly the time frame that I would have been studying the Illuminati. You know, and I was given notes in class to study by my professor. So I know that they had made their meeting notes public. And it, that was something new. Like they used to make them secret for, I guess, 10 years, and then they would release them to the public or something like that. I'm doing this from memory like 30 years ago, but it was something like that. And so the professor had gotten his hands on some that had been made public and we studied them in class. So it's possible this guy, Steve Jackson, got a hold of these minutes and from some of the things being said or risks being discussed at the time, got some of the ideas for them. And so they seem to be like fortune teller cards, right? Because again, these are the global leaders coming together doing these Meeting. So, of course, they're going to have a lot of intel on like things that have been threats that we're not even aware of, like a pandemic, for example. Or perhaps Steve Jackson is a psychic, or Steve Jackson's a secret guy, ex military, and he's putting all his stuff on these cards in 1995. I I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. But bringing it back to Jonathan Odie, you know, he has a amazing amount of knowledge about these types of topics. But I wanted to get you guys educated a little about some of the things he's going to mention. Otherwise, they won't mean anything to you or you're just going to go, this guy sounds like a loop-de-loo. You know what I mean? Like It is based in stuff, what he's saying. How far you want to take it in your own mind is up to you. All right, let me play you this NBC6 South Florida newscast before we get into the police interrogation. It's labeled alleged Trump Dorel gunman Jonathan Odie went from dead broke to property buying spree in one month. This is May 18th, 2018. This is when this news article came out. I'm going to play it for you. And this is what 
uh, Odi said came from the P. Diddy settlement that he got to shut up about the FOs that Cassie mentioned in her complaint that I read you earlier in the podcast. Listen to this. He is accused of shouting negative remarks about President Trump at the resort bearing his name. But who exactly is Jonathan Odi? Investigators have been digging into the 42-year-old from South Africa's past all day to figure out what led him to open fire inside the resort lobby. NBC6's Marissa Bag has been looking at his past, and she joins us live with his story. Marissa? Jackie and Jawan, we know that the suspect lived here at this apartment building off of Northwest 53rd Street in Doral for about the last three and a half years. And when federal agents first got here early this morning, they evacuated the east end of this building as a safety precaution. Then investigators took their time here today, spending about 14 hours going through the suspect's thing. Calm, cool, and polite. That's how neighbors describe the man now under the microscope of the FBI and the ATF. It's weird. It's crazy. He was a calm person. He was really friendly. 42-year-old Jonathan Odie called this Doral apartment building home until this morning when he opened fire inside the Trump National Doral lobby. As police collect his belongings for evidence, including his Jeep, we dug into his past and found he's invested in several properties in recent years. Following a divorce in 2014, Odie claimed his net worth was negative $1,800. According to court records, he was making $2,000 a month as a self-employed personal trainer. But in the months after his divorce, he purchased five properties across Miami-Dade County, totaling $765,000. Each one was sold within two years for $943,000. Property records reveal Odie and his now inactive real estate firm, Odie Investments LLC, do not currently own any property in the county. Neighbors in Doral didn't know about his investments. They're still trying to wrap their heads around what happened. And we reached out to an attorney representing Odie. Her name is Ray Sheeran. She tells us that she's looking into all the possibilities, including, quote, into everything that prompted this event and what occurred during this event. Well, Odie says that money came from P. Diddy to get him to be quiet and shut up. But after he does this settlement, he realizes a few things. Number one, he realizes that P. Diddy wants to punish him in some way. And so he sends Ross out to Rick Ross out to threaten him. And when that happens, that seems to trigger Odie in saying that there was a clause in his settlement agreement for quiet enjoyment meaning you cannot disturb Odie after the settlement agreement was signed in any way, because if you did, you've disrupted his quiet enjoyment following the settlement agreement, which is a clause. And so he said that that breached the agreement, and therefore I think he was going to circle back and try to sue Diddy again. And when that happened, it set him into a state of paranoia because he felt like there was people following him and threatening him and, you know, like, like almost like Diddy was going to really come for him now because he didn't just walk away at the settlement. Now, one way that he seems to demonstrate this like threatening behavior is that he feels that Diddy is trying to work with the FBI or the CIA in showing that Jonathan is actually like extorting him. And so he's trying to get him arrested. So anyway, this makes him more and more paranoid. And then one day he just decides, and this is his own words, to give America a wake-up call, that there is huge corruption in the government, and he's also talking about, you know, what he has now seen with Diddy and some other big musical players as they're super corrupt, and these awful things are happening to people. He, he might have witnessed Cass crying or saying she doesn't want to do it, like getting into the psyche of this guy's head. Think about it. He's now seeing these people who are this time like icons, pillars of the community, and he's the only one who knows that like Diddy's abusing allegedly Cassie physically, giving her huge amounts of drugs, seeing this girl not want to participate, crying, feeling like maybe she was acting like she felt sex trafficked to him as a sex worker, you know, she might not be afraid to let her guard down with him. She, you know, he would have seen all of these things. He would have seen huge power players doing 
crazy stuff around Diddy. And all of a sudden, all this concept of the good guys and the, you know, these powerful, great people are shattered, right? And he's like, oh my God. Now this would make him believe more and more that these ideas of these theories are true because it's almost like Diddy's validating them for him. And perhaps Diddy and some of his powerful people believe in some of these theories and they're telling him about them. And because they're coming from them, like, oh, I was having dinner you know, with Trump last year and I heard this. He's like, this must be real, right? So Trump Trump was telling me about secret societies over dinner a year ago. And so he, someone's telling him the story in a position of power. And he's like, this must be true. And I think that's what happened. Now, you, before I play you his interrogation, I want to tell you that I found him. He's in jail. He's in jail in Miami. And make no mistake, he's not expired or dead or like everybody's saying. That's not what's happening. He's there. But what is weird is I could not find any news about a guilty verdict to do with a jury trial or, you know, his sentencing, like a press release around what he got, his final outcome of his sentencing was, how many years he was going to be in prison. Now, maybe it's that he just pleaded guilty. And so that was it. He went off to jail with no hubbub. But what I tend to think more is that it's possible that he is helping with an ongoing investigation that maybe the FBI or police officers out of Miami are working on. And perhaps they didn't publicize his sentencing because it's still up for grabs, meaning depending on how much he helps in whatever investigation they're working on or potential indictment, that maybe then he'll get a deal. Like he's serving his time now for his crime, but they might lower it because it's a state felony. They use multiple state felonies. I can see them on the jail inmate website. They might be able to negotiate, you know, lesser time for him if he's helping them. So who knows? Diddy could be under investigation and this guy is helping as an informant or whatever. And so his final sentencing hasn't been determined. I mean, if you don't know what I'm talking about, think about Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, Jen Shaw and her assistant, Stewart. Stewart flipped on Jen Shaw and he was indicted and we haven't really heard a peep about his sentencing. So why is that? Well, why is that? Because he's probably helping to indict a bunch more people that are doing Ponzi schemes as part of his plea deal. So that might be why we still haven't heard what time Stewart's getting and he's going to avoid jail over it. Now, this guy, obviously, being a shooter, isn't going to be able to just stay home and help the cops, you know, so he's serving time, but maybe he's an informant. I'd say Miami-Dade uh, State police officers were notified by Cassie of what Diddy did to her, right? And even though, you know, she did this case in a civil litigation, I would imagine that the FBI was alerted to what the, some of the claims in here are. They're pretty serious claims. Sex trafficking is a huge priority for Miami, Dade County, and Florida as a whole. All right. So without further ado, here he is in all his glory. Jonathan Odie spilling the tea to the CIA after his Durrell shooting at Trump International Hotel. Now, one thing I want to say really quick before I drop this audio, it's about 30 solid minutes. I'm not going to interrupt it. It can get offensive at times for some people. So take a trigger warning if you want. Uh, it can get political at moments. He sways all over the place in that regards. He brings up a, a bunch of different theories, some of which might be offensive to people. You're going to want to quit a few times probably, but I really promise you that if you listen to the whole thing and you listen to the parts that really interest you as a whole, you're going to get a lot out of this audio. Like, I need you to trust me on it, okay? Don't give up. Stick with it. And also, I want to say that in the beginning, there are a few clips that are repetitive because they were meant to kind of draw you into the audio. 
So they're like hot listen snippets. And I have those in the beginning and then it's going to pull you into the full audio. And then it's going to stop at Stormy Daniels because he goes into a whole thing with Stormy Daniels. And so we don't have time for that today. And then after that, we're going to get to NT. So please, please, please hang on through this audio. It is really, I mean, if, if nothing more, freaking interesting to hear how this guy thinks. And again, some of the things he says turned out to be shockingly true. You don't have... Uh, Time in the United States? Yeah. Just my dog bubbles. My dog? Yeah. Davis and Ross, which they good buddies, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they, they're gay. Who? Both. Diddy and Ross and Cabin, they're all gay. Okay? DJ Kelly, Rick Ross, yeah. and P. Diddy, yeah. they're all gay? Yeah. Gotcha. Right. Cabin is a Hamas supporter. Okay. A who supporter? Hamas. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I say the wrong. Uh, no, 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 no. Hamas supporter. Okay. All right. I had sex with Cassie and Sean. Basically, he would uh, he would masturbate, tell me what to do with Cassie. I had like 15 encounters, and I heard a lot. Oh, uh, hidden in plain sight. It's hidden. Uh, yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Okay. okay, how do I know this? Yeah, that's what I want to know. How do you know this? Do you know Sean Combs? Puff Daddy. Yeah. P Diddy, whatever you call himself. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, he's part of what's called the Boule. The, the Boule. The Boule is a branch of the Illuminati. Okay. And it's the black people. Okay. Uh, I'm from Africa, so I'm not a racist. Okay. okay you're my brother, so I like black people. Okay. My, my mom, I was raised by an by a African woman in my house. Okay. okay. She was just a servant, but she was my, my own. She you know, took care of me. Right. So I love black people. Okay. okay. Um, I had settlement with Sean. Okay. He's Donald Trump. Okay. Because he used to belong to their side. You understand? He used to belong to that illuminated group that I told you about, which is an elite group, okay, of individuals which run the whole country. Okay. All right. All right. Um, basically, what I did, did you tell him how, did you explain him about the message? Or the no, message? please, please, please. Elaborate. On Thursday, turning to Friday, basically, I went to Donald Trump. I went through the, the gates. I took a, the, no, sorry, I jumped the fence and I took the American flag, I put it in the front desk and I blew the chandelier. I, basically, what I did that for is to transmit a statement to the American people and to Donald Trump that we're not accepting any more corruption and abuse from their system of friends. Okay. okay? Donald's still blind because he thinks that he had, he let Hillary off the hook and she's okay. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying, okay. Keep going. Um, it ain't like that. The CIA and then they want to do the same thing that he did to JFK. Okay. okay. Alright. Why? Because they want the United States to fall. They, they've already been creating a state of chaos and confusion in the United States. And they want the United States to fall. Donald was against their agenda and won the presidency. Okay. He did get help from Russia. He did get help from the Saudis. He also got help from a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. in here, which is the electoral college vote. And he got a lot of support from Republican people. Okay. okay. Um, the elections, yeah, they weren't fair, but he wanted the electrical college vote. Right, right. Which is the Republican vote, basically, he got him through, okay? Mm -hmm. He didn't get the the popular. Uh, popular vote. Right, okay. Right. I, I hear you. So going. basically the interior, he got he made it. He's president elect by the electoral college. So he made it. The situation is that he still hasn't kicked out the corruption from the system. He's letting them stay due to uh due to money basically. Because they all like making money. That's why they're all billionaires, etc. So there's only a few, there's select few of that run the country, okay? Mm -hmm. Um. So, if you, I know you may or may not, I know you're going to believe me. For the full scoop, join the Dishing Drama Dana Patreon. The link is in this audio description. It's only $6 a month and you'll get the best information and tea about the things you care about. 
and even the things you don't know you care about. What are you waiting for?